Good morning. I'm Andrea Sederstrom, Siemens Treasurer. Now normally I'm the one behind the scenes, writing the checks, balancing the books, but today we are honoring someone whom without SEMA probably would not exist. The honorary chair recognition is bestowed upon an individual who has continually supported SEMA's efforts. Frank Tobin has been a member of our board of directors or has served as an advisor throughout many years. He's seen to it that our efforts have been forever immortalized in various forms from slides to photo to digital media. He writes the press release, he calls in the favors in order to get SEMA's message effectively seen and heard. Without his efforts, SEMA's events would go unknown. He is the silent, behind the scenes epitome of sacrifice and service. Here to present our honorary chair this year is a woman who is as passionate and dedicated to her craft as much as her faith. Melody Thomas Scott just recently celebrated her 35th anniversary starring as Nikki Newman on The Young and the Restless. Her initial, Frank, her initial work with Frank was professional at first. Eventually, Frank miraculously helped lead the show to the number one position in December of 1988, where it still remains today. Along the way, she and Frank developed a unique and God-given friendship that, as in love, will never end. Having a friendship that reaches back over 25 years, you could say that their history is anything but young and altogether restless. Please join me in welcoming the lovely Melody Thomas Scott. Thank you so much, Andrea. Can everybody hear me? Okay. All right, the glasses. I actually even have a magnifying glass under here in case my prescription's not so up to date. I do. <laughs> you may see that again shortly. Well, well, well. I am not sure where to start when speaking about Frank. Um, although more difficult is when to stop. So I'm gonna try to make it short because I was warned. We have a, a time limit here, so. And we already said a lot of good things. We know one of his greatest qualities is his unshakable loyalty, and boy, can I verify that. That's apparent in his 20 plus year commitment to this wonderful organization. Not only has he been their publicist for over a decade, and he's not even supposed to be a publicist today, but he can't help it. He's been running around all morning, right now, sitting, making notes. I, Frank, it's your honor today. Don't work today. It's impossible. He, he has to. So he has been their official publicist for over a decade, also a founding member of SEMA. Personally, I think it's time that my Frankie is canonized. I met Frank at a photo shoot for a magazine cover I was doing with my youngest daughter, Elizabeth, who was five months old at the time. Elizabeth will be 26 this year. I had never met anyone like Frank before. He talked a mile a minute. And to this day, I often have to tell him, sorry, Frankie, that didn't come through. Let's start at the top again, please, slower this time. And fortunately, he does take direction well. Initially, I knew Frank in a professional capacity. Andrea just said the, what I was about to say, but I'll just remind you that Bill Bell had brought him on board to The Young and the Restless to boost the show's worldwide popularity. And not only did Frank do that, but as Andrea said, helped take it to the number one position in the Nielsen's ratings, and it is still to this day number one. So we're still proud of him for that. We'll never let him forget it. <laughs> to be a publicist, a good one anyway, you have to have a multitude of abilities that are very hard to come by in this town. Tenacity, 
energy, commitment, drive. Frank possesses all of these, including the most important one. He cares. I mean, he truly cares for each and every client, uh, sometimes more than the client themselves. Frank has a way of knowing how to make me say yes to something that I don't want to do. <laughs> I hate that about him. <laughs> but invariably, he's right, and I am glad that I did it. I hate that about him, too. <laughs> but Frank quickly became a welcome fixture in our home, our events, and our hearts. On paper, we really couldn't have less in common. I'm an only child. Frank is one of 17. He graduated in history cum laude on an academic scholarship at Georgetown. On the other hand, uh, after only about a year, USC and I came to a mutual agreement that I would not be returning. <laughs> Over the years, we have worked, but worked hard together, and we've had a lot of fun, so much fun, on and off the show. We worked, we laughed, we cried, we ate, we worked and laughed and cried and ate some more. Frank is always the first one to the dinner table and the last one to stop talking. <laughs> Our travels of the world together beg not to be mentioned. But here's just one hint, never let Frank drive a rental car. <laughs> As a matter of fact, just don't let him drive at all. Because you're, you're bound to be pulled over for a DWL that's driving while laughing. <laughs> Thankfully, for time purposes, most of our funniest memories cannot be shared today. But I am grateful that fate and God and my angels sent me my best friend, disguised as a publicist. Over the past 20 years, Frank has been there for SEMA, and over the past 25 years, he's been there for my husband, Edward, and our family, and we love him with all of our hearts, and I know that you all do too. So come on up and get your award, Frankie. Thank you, uh, Nancy. Thank you, Melody. Thank you, Andrea. Andrea is my SEMA partner in crime. Andrea, I'd share a jail cell with you anywhere, <laughs> anytime, anywhere. In the spring of 1993, which was 21 years ago, my dear friend who's departed now, Camilla Broderick, dropped me off at a volunteer meeting for the first ever SEMA because she thought SEMA was where I was supposed to be. I had just started my own PR company and was head over heels in work and professional obligations. That was a period of my life When I hadn't lost my Catholic faith, but I just wasn't comfortable with where I was practicing it. But Camilla was right. SEMA was right where I was supposed to be. SEMA was where I first encountered these amazing Catholics in the entertainment industry. Writers, producers, directors, actors, so many people. Incredible people like Jack and Pat Shea, who's here today. Father Tony Scannell, who's here today. Barbara and Gary Ganji, Bob and Marlene O'Neill, Ann Furia, Jane Abbott, Mike and his dear departed first wife, Deborah Parker, Father Ken DC. John Kelly, Pat Bourne, Bron Brian Oppenheimer, so many other people over the last 20 years, so many amazing Catholics who made me feel right where I was supposed to be. 1993, SEMA's founding purpose, among others, was to honor films and TV projects that made clear the word of God. I'm so proud that two decades later, SEMA's purpose is still clear and that today's honorees, the Monuments Men, Cesar's Last Fast, CBS News, Sunday Morning, renews that commitment. I'm also so proud that today SEMA is under the leadership of the next generation of Catholic professionals, incredible, gifted, and talented people. 
people like our president, Nancy Bevins, Vice President Cynthia Chambers, Molly Hansen, the fabulous Andrea, Beverly Nichter, John Clisham, Sister Rose, Haskell, Patrick, Father Eddie. Anyhow, back then I was asked to join the SEMA board. I did. Of course they needed a publicist, which is probably why they asked me to be on the board. <laughs> so I volunteered my services and I was publicist for the next two years up until today. But I was right where I was supposed to be. SEMA opened the door for me to become involved with something I'd always wanted to be involved in, faith-based media projects. So I had the great privilege to become involved with an extraordinary group of religious men and women to do publicity for their film projects and media projects. Father Willie Raymond in Holy Cross um, with the Rosary at the Rose Bowl in 2007. Father Ron Schmidt in his wonderful spellbinding Auschwitz documentary, The Labyrinth. Father Frank Desiderio. Father Tony Scannell and Francisca Communications. Sister Rose and her film festival. I was right where I was supposed to be. These are incredibly gifted and talented men and women, incredibly gifted and talented men and women who need our, your time, they need your talent, they need your treasure. So please don't leave today without speaking to them, encouraging them, and supporting them. I am the third oldest of uh, 17. Um, I have a 16 brothers and sisters, I have 58 nieces and nephews, 15 great-grandchildren. I salute my parents, Frank, who's age 89, and Noreen, age 5, who'd be here today, but ill health prevents them. I'm so lucky that my dad always encouraged me by telling me I didn't name you Francis X for nothing. I'm also so lucky to have Tobin family members here today. My sister Noreen and her husband Gene are talented screenwriters. They have encouraged me. Melody, you think I was a handful. Forget it without Noreen. <laughs> My brother, my brother Robert Tobin is here. He's an incredible, passionate, and compassionate social worker. My brother Dan Tobin here, he's the best carpenter in Santa Barbara. His wife Amy, incredible attorney. My uncle Bill and Aunt Mary Beth, they've been fixtures in my life for 60 years. I will tell you that I've had a lot of success in this town and a lot of failure. And when you have failure in this town, it's the people that support you doing that. And my friends are here today. Alice Buckley, who I met through the Archdiocese Juvenile Detention Program. Susan Casey and Vivian Four, my rowing buddies. Gary and Rochelle Edwards. Rochelle is the best CPA in LA, and the real reason I am not behind bars with Andrea today. <laughs> my high school prom date turned Emmy-nominated producer Roxanne Messina Captor and her husband Rich Captor. And my partner, Renee Young, who bids me, well, bids me uh, good fortune from New York. Okay, 25 years ago, I met and began to work with three amazing people. Two of them are here today. Melody Thomas Scott and her husband, producer Edward Scott. When I started doing PR in Hollywood, I was disappointed that I had arrived too late for the golden age of Hollywood. I didn't arrive too late. That all changed when I walked into that photo shoot and met this incredible force of nature and wonderful gift of God's creation named Melody Thomas Scott. By an act of God a year later, and by the will of Bill Bell, I was a publicist on Young and Restless and Bold and Beautiful and I had a chance to work closely with Edward and Melody. I was right where I was supposed to be. Over the next 25 years, I was get to know, love, and work with these two incredible people. Melody Scott is a pu publicist's dream. She's beautiful, talented, sexy, smart as a whip, and a laugh riot. She's one of the last great stars of the Hollywood studio system. When she shows up, you're ready to go. Ed Scott is simply the best TV producer there is, and there are six Emmys to prove that. There's nobody like Ed Scott. More than colleagues, Ed and Melody have invited me to share their professional and personal lives, to witness their ups and downs, the good times and the bad times that come with any life and career worth living. And I'm so grateful for that. They were there for me during my darkest hours, and I'm so grateful for that. They never tried to do my job, but insisted that I do it and do it to the best of my ability with their support and encouragement. And I wasn't up to par, when I had some hair-brained, lame-brained, stupid idea, they just laughed and said, try it again, try again, try again. I'm forever grateful for their support and friendship. I had the privilege of working with Carol O'Connor for the final decade of his career. His son's suicide, two notorious lawsuits brought against him by a drug dealer. And Carol's final illness and death in 2001. 
FEMA honored Carol O'Connor with a Lifetime Achievement Award in 1996. And you would never know it from his 45-minute rambling acceptance speech that he didn't want to come. <laughs> and that his wife Nancy and I had to drag him, kicking and screaming, to the Beverly Hills Hotel. Pat Shea there in the front row, who's the head writer of Archie Bunker's Place, will tell you that Carol O'Connor was no laugh riot and no walk in the park. <laughs> right, Pat? Okay. First, Carol didn't want to come. Then Carol didn't want to stay. Then he didn't want to leave. <laughs> it was one of the only two times that I ever saw Carol O'Connor recreate the role of Archie Bunker in public. It was very soon after his son Hugh's suicide, and Carol knew he needed to make you laugh, he needed to make his wife laugh, he needed to make himself laugh. And he had no problem acting out an entire scene from all in the family to your edification. I will close with this memory of the only other time I saw him do Archie Bunker. At the end of his life, Carol had a lot of health problems. We went through various stages at various hospitals, UCLA Medical Center, John, St. John's Hospital. It was one hospital after another. During those medical crises, his wife, Nancy O'Connor, would move right into the hospital room with him for the duration. Two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. It's a long haul. During one of Carol's worst sieges, I got the idea that I should drop by the hospital in the evening and kind of look in on them. They seemed, there were two older people, they were all alone. He was gone, and I didn't know what else to do. I would usually drop by around 9 p.m., I'd sneak into the hospital, it was deserted, sneak past reception, I would arrive and I'd help Nancy pull out the fold-away bed, she'd get changed, kind of like tuck them in, kind of give them some gossip, you know, catch him up on stuff that's going on, wish him good night. Well, this night was different. St. John's Hospital was silent as a tomb. There was no one on duty on the floor. The halls were dark. You could hear a pin drop. I started to get this terrible feeling in my gut as I walked down the corridor. I got this feeling that Carol was going to die that night. And when I arrived in his room, it seemed my worst feelings were confirmed. I could just imagine the National Enquirer headline, Publicist fails to revive TV legend while wife stands by helpless, you know? <laughs> Carol was lying in bed looking like a death warmed over. Nancy was in a state. The room was a mess. The fold-away bed like was never put away. And I thought, uh-oh. So Nancy says, oh, good, you're here. I need your help. So I say, what can I do? Nancy pulls out this large, beautiful rosary and says, I don't know how to say the rosary. I need to say the rosary tonight. Nancy was a Catholic convert. She converted from Episcopalianism, and I asked her, do you know the prayers? The Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, and Nancy nodded. And right then, I understood where I was supposed to be. I was Carol's publicist for 13 years. He didn't want to do publicity. God put me in that room that night. I was right where I was meant to be. All those years, saying the family rosary, my mom and my dad, my 16 brothers and sisters, North Artesian Avenue in Chicago. All those years of monthly rosaries at uh, Queen of Angels grade school in Chicago, DePaul Academy, Georgetown. All those years and all those ro rosaries prepared me for this moment. So we started the rosary with me leading the glorious mysteries of the rosary and Nancy following. And as I started each decade, I would explain them. And as we proceeded, of course, I started talking faster. And I started talking faster. And I started talking faster. And somewhere in the beginning of the third glorious mystery, like a voice from the tomb, I heard, Jesus Christ, Frank, would you slow it down just a little? <laughs> You's working those rosary beads way, way too fast. I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> Nancy and I, who our tears are streaming down our face, look up, and there's Carol sitting up in bed. <laughs> like the Easter Bunny, you know? Big smile on his face. So I say, okay, big guy, you're so smart. Why don't you lead the rest of the rosary? And he goes, well, I will. Thank you very much, Frank. <laughs> Carol led the rest of the rosary. So just like at the scene awards, Carol knew he needed to make us laugh, and he did. And we got through that night. I was right where I was supposed to be. 25 years in Hollywood culminated in this moment, which was the single most powerful experience in my life because I knew how to say the rosary. For those members of the Catholic laity here, if you haven't had this experience, 
I hope you have this experience one day. I hope someone in dire need comes to you in their hour of need and asks if you know how to say the rosary. And you will know that you're right where you're supposed to be. Speaking of right where I'm supposed to be, it's time for me to get back in the PR trenches. So I wanna, before I go, I want to thank my wonderful team, Cynthia Chambers, Eleanor Rudy, Howard Wise, and I want to thank you all very much. Oh my, <laughs> thank you, Frank. I, this, this man is uh, amazing. I want to share with you how humble he is. When I first called him to ask if he would be our honorary chair this year, he said, oh no, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. And he had some, he thought about it some more. Maybe he prayed and, and he, did, he did accept and we're so very grateful now. That's a great, a great tribute to, uh, we don't have any footage of Carol O'Connor. We weren't videotaping then. So we have to have the words from the people who were here. That's a great story. And uh, thank you too. Also, we have um, Pat Shea with us today. She's one of the founders of SEMA. <laughs> so Frank had mentioned her, so I just wanted to acknowledge, we have a lot of actually SEMA um, past board members in the room. And of course, it, it's taken all of us to get us here. 